No price talk and no Lambos. This is not another crypto podcast. Welcome to Ignition. I'm your host, Gillian Godsell, and each week we will be looking at the problems solved by blockchain. I'll be going deep, deep with the people building the apps and communities which are changing the world around us. Well, welcome to Ignition, the EOS Dublin podcast with me, Gillian Godsell. And today I have a guest on who was on previously, but we've got some more exciting things to talk about. Luke Stokes joins me. And Luke, you see, he's kind of interesting. The serial entrepreneur, Steam Witness, an EOS advocate, a team member of EOS DAC, and involved with the FIO Foundation. And he lives in Puerto Rico. Oh, my goodness. That's too much wonderfulness altogether. Good morning, Luke. And thank you for joining the show. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Brilliant. So you were on the show before. That was last year, I think, wasn't it? We, um, and we covered off some of these things. But I'd like to go back over them again because things move on. And, you know, maybe kind of start off with, with that. EOS and Dan Larimer and the whole blockchain and why why you were attracted to it and steam it and steam with monsters. So yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'll try to summarize all that together. I think you know, I first you know, I first bought my first Bitcoin in 2013 in January. I spent 50 bucks and I got two and a half Bitcoin, and I I just was intrigued by this whole internet money concept. And I, from that, I thought through how wow, you know, what I mean, we can have stores of value without governments defining what that is, and it just went on to this incredible whirlwind ride, and eventually paid off my house in, in Nashville, Tennessee, with Bitcoin. And oh, but I was, you didn't? I, I did, yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, That's I have a whole like, Steam post I can tell the, you about it, and then, you know, so it's just. It was a big part of my personal story because growing up, uh, my parents lost our house when I was in high school. And so just knowing that, you know, we weren't going to go through that same thing that we, our house was going to be uh, for my kids were, were going to be uh, protected. And and it's funny, too, because I, you know, I remember the big run up to twelve hundred and then it crashed down to two fifty. And then when it was on its way back up to like eight hundred, nine hundred, I was looking at my wife going, you know, we're kind of at that place where we could pay off the house again. Because we could have before and we didn't. So then we did. And of course, everyone knows it went to $20,000, you know, per Bitcoin after that. So we could have paid off a lot more houses. But I just it achieved, for, achieved what, what it needed to do. So that's very important. Oh, yeah. I have zero regrets. And I, I just I'm super passionate about the entire space. And at the time I was running, you mentioned being an entrepreneur. I ran a, a company with my business partner called Foxycart. It's an e-commerce shopping cart system. And we accepted cryptocurrency through our shopping cart. But no one really seemed to care. And I was really discouraged by that. And back in 2013, I was doing presentations on how Bitcoin is going to be more disruptive than the internet. And I just, I couldn't get people to really care. And so when Steam came along and I saw, wow, this is a blockchain that anybody can use. I mean, if they know how to use Reddit or Medium or you know Facebook, they can use this blockchain and they can actually earn and use cryptocurrency. And I just got so excited about it. I joined in, in June of 2016. And you know, I'd looked at the whole proto shares and bit shares thing. So I'd heard of Dan Larimer, but it was like it was all so confusing to me. I didn't quite understand it all. And then, and then once I started kind of reading more of Dan's stuff and realizing uh, his passion to create tools to create freedom in the world, I was like, man, this guy's amazing. And then, kind of through that process, you know, obviously followed his projects after that with EOS and building a, a mechanism where you can essentially build anything on a blockchain, you know, kind of this, this grand vision that whatever you want to create, uh, you can do it. And without the limitations that some of the other kind of computerized blockchains like Ethereum have. And, and it was just, you know, it's been an amazing ride. Uh, you mentioned Steam Monsters. I mean, there's so many incredible projects on Steam. The last time I checked, there was almost 500 different applications and projects on the Steam blockchain. One of them is Steam Monsters. It's a great game. I play with my kids. Uh, it's kind of like a, like a card, turn-based card game. And it's it's super fun. And you can own collectibles. I have a card that I think is worth like three, four hundred dollars. You know, it's a legendary gold foil pack, you know. And, it's, it's stuff like this is just super exciting and fun. It makes blockchains become more real in people's lives. Yes, I think that's what I was talking to somebody earlier. And again, it's so scary from the outside looking in. Anything that makes it accessible. And if your children are playing Steam Monsters, that's cool. I mean, like they are there already. So it's like, I mean, if you look at children nowadays who grew up with smartphones, you know, it's just they're natural. Whereas um, I, I remember when smartphones came in. <laughs> I remember when we had landlines. I even remember when we had those things you used to uh, ring, you know, you ring, you ring the operator. Now that was down the country and it wasn't in Dublin. But even still, my aunt had one of those things where you'd ring and your number was, you know, Trelton 22. <laughs> <laughs> so it's funny. But so, so your kids now are, are very fortunate 
because they're they're young children, aren't they? They're in ten or so. Of yeah, they're uh, ten, eight, and and five, soon to be six. And and actually, like my oldest son, he he'll tell everyone this story. He loves it. Uh, he got into Smart Cash, is another cryptocurrency, pretty early on. And I was blogging about it on Steam and how he had bought some some more smart cash with his own money that he'd earned and the community donated even more smart cash to him. And it was really exciting. And it was really neat. And then, and then smart cash like skyrocketed up in price one day. Mm-hmm. And he's like, dad, I'm going to sell like a third of my smart cash. So he sold, he got a thousand dollar laptop computer that he now plays on every day. It's his gaming computer. And he'll tell everyone he got it because of cryptocurrency. And it's just such a fun story. So for him, it's very real. All this is very real. Well, do you know your children are very lucky? And I was, again, I'm repeating myself at an earlier conference, I was saying, it's beholden on us that are really enthused by it. And you're doing it too as well, is to make sure more and more people, so it's not just your children know about it, it's other kids know about it, because it does, it's all that fundamental, I mean, I'm calling it a movement now at this stage, you know, I sound as though it's a cult, it's not, but, but your kids are so lucky that they are familiar with it, they're happy with it. If they want to, you know, play games all day, they can, or whatever, not obviously in school, whatever. but, you know, it's, it's, they're not scared of it. And that's a huge gift you've given your children. I I think it's going to be the future. I mean, I felt this way in 2013. I feel this way now. It's going to be extremely disruptive in a really good way. It has one of the most incredible potentials to increase human well-being on the planet. Because for the first time ever, we have a mechanism for global nonviolent consensus. And prior to this, it was whoever has, you know, the biggest army, the biggest threat can kind of determine what truth is. As they always say, the winners get to write the history books. And so for the first time, we as a species can point to say, look, this is truth. This consensus that that is backed by all of this hashing power or all these votes on a DPOS system like or or a proof of stake system, like this is truth and we all agree. And here and it's very difficult to attack or change. It's immutable. And that that the consequences of that, the the ramifications of that. I just, I don't know that people really understand yet, and I, but they're going to. And, and like you said, it's going to start with our kids. It's going to start with people just using this in everyday life. You know, it's still very early on. It's very difficult to use. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, one of the projects I'm, I'm working with that will make that easier. But, and, and even to uh, just figuring out how to use this for more practical purposes. Like we're going to talk about DAX and this idea that you can have companies and nonprofits and even eventually governments using these decentralized autonomous community systems. I'm just, I'm very excited about the future. Very yeah. bullish. <laughs> no, no, I, I'm exactly the same as you. Cause I've seen also, we're talking earlier with again, so the person I was talking to about nationalities. And if you think about it, I was born in Ireland. So between the my place of birth, my family, the culture, the history, I'm an Irish woman and you know, I'm a very proud Irish woman. But if I, the baby had been transported over to Paris you know, I would end up being a very, you know, proud French woman. And, you know, the accent of birth of where, where we land up is quite arbitrary, really. It's just it's the history and the culture around us that, that make this inform us. But if we could be part of communities that didn't necessarily have to have those almost, I say, artificial boundaries, you know, they're, 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 or just, but they're based on geography, nothing more than that, just geography. And it, it makes it so much more possible for people to come together and do things. So that's what I'm going to ask you. Explain to me what a DAC is and how the EOS stack is working and your involvement in it. I am really, really excited about DAX. A DAC is a decentralized autonomous community. And essentially it's a group of people with a shared goal. So that can include anything from a community to a neighborhood, to a business or a nonprofit, or even yes, a government. And what EOS DAC has been doing since mainnet launch is running our EOS block producer as a DAC. So we have a group of people that have the token and they, the EOS DAC token, and they come to our member client and they read our constitution and they agree to be join as a member. And then from there, they can set up a profile and they can even register to be a custodian. And then the token holder members vote on the custodians. And every seven days, those top 12 voted custodians actually have a multi-signature permission set right on the blockchain. And so they get to essentially make decisions for the DAC. So whenever the DAC spends money, all the budget decisions, all the changes to the contracts and constitution, anything like that is done in such a way that's fully decentralized and fully supported by all those who have skin in the game. And this is just so important. Like, for example, on EOS, there are so many contracts and projects that are completely centralized. And most people don't realize this, but whoever has access to that private key for that token contract or that application contract can just unilaterally remove all your tokens immediately. A lot of people think of EOS tokens as being their own property, but unfortunately, unless access to that private key is distributed and there's some 
sense of trust on how that token's going to be used and that contract's going to be uh, kept as is, it's very, very uh, scary out there. I mean, it really, I mean, any of these tokens can just be modified so that you could go into your wallet and they just wouldn't be there anymore. You know, they have that ability on EOS and it's, it's something that we're hoping to help with as far as the EOS DAC technology. It's all open source. It's available for anyone. And we're working hard to make it easier and easier to use so that eventually you can come and just like as a DAC as a service, you can just pay the DAC to run uh, the API, the front end client, the back end, you know, set all the contracts and code. And that way it would just be super easy. And that's what we're hoping for. And we're hoping that pretty much every project in the EOS space will realize the importance of decentralizing the governance of their contracts and their token contracts and their applications so that their community can trust that those applications are secure and that no one person could ever make a unilateral change. Like in our case, for example, we just changed the constitution. We only changed one word. We changed <laughs> Median to mean, because we changed the custodial pay from being a median to being a mean. Well, that was a, a contract change in our code, and it was a constitutional update. Both of those changes required 10 of 12 custodians to pass. So we had a multi-sig proposal, just like you see on the EOS uh, mainnet between the block producers. We had to have 10 custodians agree for that change to happen. And once they agreed, it was executed, and the on-chain data was updated. It's really exciting stuff. How do you get around the potential issue of the same 12 custodians sitting on the top? Do they change much? They do change a bit. Like we just had two uh, custodians drop out and two more join. And ultimately, it's about a secure, trusted group of people. So it doesn't really matter if they change. Some people say, you know, our seven day period is crazy. You know, oh, man, that's too much change and it changes too much. But it doesn't change all that much. And I think it's the whole goal is essentially just making sure the people you have there are trusted. So it, it rolls over, but in such a, in such frequency that you're unlike, for example, we're about to go into elections here at next week, European Parliament and also local elections. But the European Parliament, it's five years. If you vote in someone who's no good, they're there for five years. So at least here, if you have a seven day, although it seems quite a short time, it allows for movement if someone is not performing or doing what they're expected to do. Absolutely. And I think that's one of the most important aspects of uh, functional governance. People have to have skin in the game. So also these custodians in order to become a custodian candidate, you have to lock up some of your EOS DAC tokens. And those tokens are locked up, I think, for 60 or 90 days after you are no longer a custodian. So you're essentially incentivized to create a good outcomes for the token that is part of the governance because you've put some of your value on the line. And at the same time, it's also a paid position. So our custodians are actually paid. And so they're kind of incentivized to be a good actor in, in the ecosystem to remain you know, in that position and get that pay. But it, it's really like, we're just starting to talk through like what's possible. For example, Liberland is a really amazing project there in Serbia. They're building basically a nation state. They just presented it in front of the UN in December. I mean, it's a really amazing project. I've been following for a long time. That's the piece of land that was sort of forgotten after the war, was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And they're using DAC technology, even EOS DAC technology. So Michael Yates on our team uh, gave a presentation there a couple months ago, and they're super excited about it. I got to meet it at the uh, Anacapoco, and it was just uh, really incredible. And, and so it's like for me to see that even governments are going to start using this technology is just really, really exciting. And do you foresee in the future, when you say governments, do you think the governments then it will be all the people or not just, you know, so everybody could have a chance you know how here, obviously, you, people get voted into the parliament, but it's it's hard to get into parliament because there are political parties involved and it takes money and it takes time and it takes, you know, influence, whatever. If a government was running a DAC, everybody would be equal, wouldn't they? I mean, that's part of the idea in that anyone can be a custodian. And I think this is kind of in a line, like in the US, for example, this was kind of in alignment with how the US experiment was. It was kind of like anybody can you know be elected. And I think that the the main difference between governments as they are today and what we're trying to build with these kind of other systems is that governments today essentially have a monopoly on the initiation of force. And that's one of the kind of defining aspects or attributes of a nation state government. Whereas these systems, there is no force. It's all on chain. Everything is defined by the smart contracts. And when we talk about a decentralized autonomous community, decentralized meaning no single point of failure. And that's why we have that multi-signature system. And autonomous doesn't necessarily mean like 
you know, automated AI or something. It just means that the functions are known. And when you put in input, you get a known output. It's very consistent. It's very trustworthy. Unlike a, a situation like in an Enron scandal or something, they have all these kind of cooked up books and you don't know what's going to happen or, or, you know, maybe some new person gets elected to parliament and they change all the rules and then it, it, there's not that consistency. Mm-hmm. And so it, for us, it's really important that everything's transparent, everything's on chain, all the reputations are, are right there and involved. And that community part of it really determines the value. Because when we think about even currency or value, money itself, it it's, has value because people believe it has value. And the more people that believe it has value, the more value it's going to have. Like according to Metcalf's law, this network as it grows becomes more valuable. So in this situation, it's like, as we build a larger and larger community, we actually build more and more value. So there's incredible opportunity for people to build communities as opposed to just building a product or a service. Because the more com- the larger the community you build, the more valuable what you're accomplishing will be. And also, if everyone involved is a token holder, they're also a customer, they're an employee, and they're an owner all together. It's really, really fascinating. It is moving on. And you mentioned earlier, the last thing I want to talk to you about, the, the FIO Foundation, about making it easier for people to transition into the crypto space. What is the FIO Foundation? I'm, I'm very excited to be working with them. I, I first met with them, uh, the DAPEX company behind FIO, and the FIO is the Foundation for Interwallet Operability. And you can check out their website at FIO.foundation. I worked with them back in October and just did consulting and advising, got to more, know more about the project and got really excited about it. And it's essentially like a, a DNS system for blockchain. So when you go to like google.com and you type that in your web browser, there's a DNS lookup that figures out what IP address that domain goes to and gives you the actual web page. It's kind of a similar thing where I could just have luke.stokes be my FIO address and you could send me any cryptocurrency you want to that address. You could send it, you know, EOS or Bitcoin or Ethereum. It wouldn't matter. And I could, I could connect that to my entire wallet or I could connect it just to one blockchain or I could connect it to a specific address on a specific blockchain. And why that's so important is that if you've ever used cryptocurrency, you know how like stressful it can be and frustrating. It is. It is. <laughs> it's just like you send it out there and it's out of your wallet, but you don't see it on the block explorer yet. And there's no metadata. So you don't know, like somebody sends you cryptocurrency. And you're like, wait, is that the right person? It was that for lunch yesterday. I don't know. And, yeah. and so this, the field uh, protocol is integrated already with uh, some of our founding members, our bread wallet. Konomi wallet, uh, Edge wallet, Bonanza's Trust wallet, uh, Shapeshift, and a lot of really big name organizations are involved in this. And it's going to make it so that you can do like e-commerce with cryptocurrency. Very easy, just like you use Venmo or PayPal, any of these kind of easy systems where you could just request, you know, you can go to a website and say, hey, I want to buy this, this, and this. And they'll say, okay, here's your fee request and just shows up right in your wallet. And it's got all the data and you know that you're sending it to the right place. There's another big part of cryptocurrency that is really a big security vulnerability right now is when someone says, hey, I want to send you Bitcoin. What's your Bitcoin address? And they send it with like a text message or, you know, some kind of I am or something. And that is in cryptocurrency or crypto spaces. That's considered a key exchange. You're taking a public key and transferring it to someone else. If, Mm -hmm. If there's a man in the middle attack. They can get in there and swap out that key with their own key. And all of a sudden you're like, yeah, I'm going to buy, you know, a Lambo for X Bitcoin, you know, and then you send it to the wrong person. <laughs> you know? And so you feel the feel protocol protects us from this because in your wallet, it actually is going to communicate with the blockchain and make sure that it uses the right public key to sign and encrypt that message so that when you get a message to someone say, hey, you know, I'm going to go ahead and send you some money. I know that I'm sending it to the right. Because it's in English or whatever. I mean, presumably you'd have other languages as well, maybe. Or would you always, it's, it's in letters. Would you have like Mandarin or would you have? You know, that's a great question. I think the, the first iteration of it at this point, I think is just using the standard kind of ASCII character, similar to how EOS works. You know, they're just yeah. kind of the, the normal traditional characters. Yeah. But that's an interesting point. Like it, they're, in the future, we have a lot of plans to have kind of these aliases, which might include your email address or your phone number and probably special characters as well. But to me, it's just, it's, it's solving one of the two major problems in cryptocurrency as I've seen it over the last six plus years. One is key management, which is really difficult to handle. And the other is just ease of use. If the wallet experience is confusing and it doesn't have the right request and send functionality where you know you're sending it to the right person, you get feedback about how that process is going and you don't have to be like freaked out by these really complicated you know, addresses. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's going to really help the whole space in a big way. 
huge. My God. So where is it at on its in its rollout? Where is, is it beta or? It's uh, right now. It's, it, we're still. Uh, it's kind of closed. Being worked on like as a closed alpha right now. Uh, mm -hmm. It's based on EOSIO technology, so it's a fork of the EOSIO code base. But it uh, uh, has some pretty significant changes. There's there's no RAM or CPU or bandwidth. Uh, there's no account names. It's all just the addresses, and there's it's a fee structure. And so the the block producers on this particular blockchain, once we launch it, will actually be the wallets and exchanges. You know the major businesses in the place will be collecting those fees and there'll be, you know, there'll be a fee to have your own domain, uh, like an annual fee, kind of like Ethereum, you know, you know, the similar systems that are doing similar things. Uh, there'll also be a, a small fee for having your own name on a domain, mm -hmm. but unlike these other uh, solutions that are just specific to one blockchain, this works for any blockchain and the blockchain doesn't have to modify anything to support it. So our hope is that we'll have a test net and hopefully even a mainnet launch sometime this year, but a wow. lot of that obviously still, you know, Current, constantly being developed, and I'm currently in their daily stand-up meetings with their tech team, uh, and I'm involved with them, kind of as kind of the in, interim CTO at this point. Once they finish a certain raise that they're working on right now, uh, that would be more of a, a part-time CTO position. And I'll be working with them more actively, but it's a, it's a great team and a really cool technology, and I think they're going to be able to pull off something really important. And I, it's one of those things where I feel like every wallet in exchange is going to be no reason not to adopt it because it creates a profit opportunity for them while making the user experience easier for their customers. So it's kind of a win for everybody. Yeah. Oh, it's amazing. I mean, that is so clever. I was on the site uh, a couple of days ago, whatever, but it, it's true because I'm a Johnny come lately. I went two years into this area, right? And I don't really spend crypto and I, I receive it and I have sent it, but I normally, when I, if I send any amount, I normally have my friend at my elbow saying, just, am I doing this right? Am I doing this right? <laughs> Because <laughs> it is, it's like stressful. It's, it's, stressful. Like, it's, and it's, it's not, not I'm not, I'm not buying Lambos or anything like that. You know, I'm so good. Oh, okay. Is, is, am I sending this right? <laughs> and I mean, and I believe in it and I love it. And, you know, I enjoy it, but it's still, it, it, make, it makes me a bit wobbly. You know, there has to be better ways. And this, the Theo Foundation sounds amazing. Wow. Well, listen, thank you so much again for your time. You're so lucky you're in the beautiful, sunny Puerto Rico. I'm very envious. But what's it like now? Is it? Uh, what's the weather like? Is it it's good? absolutely beautiful. I had a, a, a morning sunrise yoga that I was able to attend on the, the roof in old San Juan. And then I went with a, a new relationship, new friend of mine. We went and went to the beach and it was great. It, we, we had, it was just so cool to meet such incredible people in the space here. In Puerto Rico. So many cool people doing so many cool things. And yes, it's absolutely beautiful outside right now. Wow. Well, well, I have to say it's a bit rainy here, but then it is Ireland. <laughs> and we had we, we did have four days of sunshine in the rose. So, so we've had our summer. We're now into our whatever it is, that rainy thing that we have the, during the, the summer months. Anyway, so thank you so much for your time. It sounds amazing. And good luck with uh, the FIO. Not even good luck. Bon voyage, I think, whatever. You, know, you don't need luck. The FIO Foundation sounds amazing. And I look forward to hearing more in due course. Thank you so very much for having me. I appreciate it.